Hello, I'm Don Moores and moderator for the forum of the general election candidates for the at-large county council seats. Our candidates are Robert Dyer, Mark Elridge, Chris P. Fiotti Jr., Nancy Florine, George Leventhal, Adal T. Owen Williams II, Hans Reamer, Shelley Skolnick, and Tim Willard. This forum is hosted by Montgomery Community Media and sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. Lena Barnes, the president of the League, is here to serve as our timekeeper. I want to thank everyone here at MCM and the League for all the hard work that <coughs> went into coordinating this <coughs> forum. I also want to thank the candidates for sharing their valuable time with us. Participating in forums like this is important to give voters the information they need in order to make informed decisions at the polls. We plan on having a lively exchange of ideas today. Here's our format. Each candidate will have the opportunity to respond to a general question at the beginning. We'll then move to a series of topical questions. For each topic, I will pose different questions to the candidates who will be split into three groups of candidates per topic. Before we move <coughs> to the next topic, each candidate will have an additional 20 seconds for additional remarks. At the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will have up to 1 minute 30 seconds for a closing statement. These questions were prepared by the League. The candidates are seated in alphabetical order, the order of the opening and closing statements, well, the closing statements, as well as the grouping of candidates and the questions posed to them, was determined by a random drawing. With that, let's start the forum. So here is the question that I throw out to you, and that is, name two experiences that make or would make you a good council member. And we're going to go first to Nancy Florine. One minute. Well, I've had the privilege of serving as a council member uh, for the past 12 years. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the things that was a real uh, learning experience for me was being a member of the County Planning Board, uh, which I did previously, which really taught me a lot about the sort of the religion of Montgomery County, which is land use in many respects. Uh, the other uh, experience I had was I was also mayor of the little town of Garrett Park. And while it has a lot fewer zeros in its budget and in its population, the issues are the same. And it's about navigating through challenging situations to find a solution that serves the needs of the community. So I'd say those are my two sort of life, uh, training experiences. Thank you. Mr. Owen Williams? As a lifelong resident of Montgomery County, <clears throat> I have two poignant experiences I believe uh, would make me a contributor to the County Council. Uh, unlike my opponents, I have been in the financial world, I have a BS in finance, and I've successfully managed over six hundred million dollars of other people's money without a complaint. Um, I bring to the table financial logic and financial experience that this county is in desperate need of. Uh, we've gone from the n wealthiest county in the United States, we're currently at number 14 and going to 15, and I think we need someone with my experience who has seen what has happened in other countries with my father being in foreign services that I believe I have a general idea <coughs> what will happen if we stay on the road that we're on. Thank you. Mr. Skolnick. Uh, thank you. Um, one experience is the 40 years that I've lived in Montgomery County. I've lived in Bethesda, Rockville, Durwood, only, and now Silver Spring. And by living in different parts of the county, I've gotten a, gotten a better understanding of the different parts of the county. And as you know, the county council at large represents the entire county, 500 square miles, a million people. So that's one experience. Um, the other one is that I served a couple years ago on the Charter Review Commission. And that enabled me to look at various aspects of the county government and also work with or meet with various members of the county government. Uh, Mr. Dyer, you're next. <coughs> Yes, I, the two experiences I've had are, first of all, I'm a lifelong resident of the county, and I attended and graduated from Good Council High School. And when I first visited there, uh, when I was touring schools, I found their motto was, one man can make a difference. And that's something I've always believed and has really led me 
to be active in the community as an advocate for the disabled, as an advocate for affordable housing against some of the policies that have been so devastating here in recent years. And secondly, as a professional musician and recording artist, I have small business experience. I've hired and fired employees. I've managed budgets and projects. And we don't have much of that experience on the council because you can see from their poor record of economic development that we need a council member who understands business. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. Mr. Leventhal. I think the most important experience for everyone is their experience with their own family. I'm a husband and father. I'm very proud of my two sons and the outstanding education that they've received in Montgomery County Public Schools. My older son was admitted to a fine university after uh, attending K through 12 in Montgomery County Public Schools. I understand how important it is that every child have the opportunity to get an outstanding start in life and continue through uh, for uh, the rest of their lives and um, become college prepared or career prepared. My wife runs a small business in our home and I've had the experience of assisting her to apply for permits. Um, and then of course my experience as an elected official for the last 12 years representing you as your at-large council member working hard to help you get your problem solved and your questions answered, serving as chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee, expanding access to health care for tens of thousands of residents, bringing a real reduction in the prevalence of homelessness in this county. I'm proud of my record and I hope you'll give me another four years on the county council. Thank you. Mr. Willard. Well, I've lived in this county for 30 <coughs> years. Uh, my wife and I raised three children here, two of which were adopted, and so we have extensive experience with the with the school system, both the good and the bad. Uh, I'm now a full-time grandfather. I've retired and I'm doing daycare service for my two-year-old grandson, whose future I'm greatly concerned about. And secondly, I've also been an activist for many years for environmental issues and for social justice mm -hmm. issues, the most recent of which was working on the 10 Mile, the Save 10 Mile Creek Coalition and I consider that a very valuable experience uh, that I would uh, bring to the council. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Eller. But I guess I can think of two experiences. Uh, one is having served on the Tacoma Park City Council for 19 years and I, what I took away from that experience was we spent a lot of time working with community. Um, when <coughs> we face difficult issues, um, we put a lot of effort into bringing people together to talk about um, what worked best for the community rather than trying to quickly jump to political solutions. And I thought that was, a, at least for me, a very valuable learning experience. And the other thing I'd point out is I was a teacher. I did this for um, 17 years in Montgomery County. And I happened to be lucky enough to teach in the school that came out of my neighborhood and is one of the most impacted schools in the county. And you get a, a fuller picture of all the things that impact on a child's learning, that it's not just what happens in the classroom, but it's the stability of housing, it's the income of the family, a myriad of things which have effect on educational outcomes. And it led me to be more interested in the county because I understood the, the breadth of decisions we make and how they impact children as they learn. Mr. Weimer? Well, I joined the county council four years ago, and um, the experience of the last four years has been enormously challenging, and I think it has made me uh, a much better council member. When I joined the council, uh, really the Great Recession was having its greatest impact on county government and on our residents. And I've been uh, privileged um, and challenged to serve in a time of uh, you know, difficult decisions about putting our county's fiscal house back in order and prioritizing the kinds of programs that our residents really care most about, education, transportation, parks, recreation, and so forth. Uh, a second important experience for me, like many others, is the personal experience of being a, uh, a parent and a father, a uh, husband. You have two boys. The oldest is in first grade. And uh, when I'm in my son's classroom, you know, it really brings to light to me the important work that we do, providing bus service and health care access, uh, after school programs, uh, you know, many, many important issues come together and I want to see this county continue to make progress. Thank you. Last but not least, Mr. Fiote. Thank you. Um, I've been in the um, 
most of my life I've been had my own business. I've been I'm a commercial real estate investor. I've had uh, a lot of experience in zoning, uh, development, infrastructure, and just about everything you could say related to the development <coughs> forward of any uh, concept in, uh, in, the, in real estate. I um, worked in the um, uh, U.S. Senate, and I learned a lot about uh, issues from the U.S. Senate um, and dealing with all aspects of uh, budget and so forth. I have um, four grandchildren, and the first one started kindergarten this year. I got quite concerned about the educational system in Montgomery County, and I have three more coming up. And I would like to say I feel that there's still a lot of things we can do to address the educational system in our county. All right, as I stated before, we're going to go in and we're going to ask groups of three of you the same question that we'll go, in the, and these are all on the same topic, so all of you will have a chance to answer questions in, the same t in this one topic, but we're going to have questions that uh, will be addressed to, specifically to, to three of you at a time. This first question uh, is going to be Mr. Elrich, Mr. Skolnick, and Mr. Willard in that order, and this question is this. Uh, BRT, the uh, transportation is our, is our topic. This first question is the bus rapid, uh, rapid transit. The county has developed an extensive bus rapid transit project. Which specific steps would you take to make this vision a reality? Discuss funding sources. Uh, first up again, Mr. Elrich. In a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we've gone through the process of putting the basic outline of the plan into the county's master plan of transportation. And the challenge is going to be to build it. We, we need an alternative to single occupancy vehicles because we're not going to be able to move people if we don't provide that alternative. So I guess my priorities are identifying the key um, parts of the system that need to be built first. Which ones have the greatest economic impact? Uh, which ones deal with the most congested corridors? And I think that's the first thing we need to do. And then we should build out from there. Um, Funding is always a challenge, and we're going to continue to look at state and federal sources. But I think we need to look at take a page out of the playbook from Northern Virginia. Uh, Northern Virginia has adopted transportation taxes on commercial property, and they use that money to build their infrastructure. Uh, they use high tolls on the Dulles Toll Road. We don't have that option. But they've really relied on, imp on, on taxes on commercial property because in their view, those are the properties that benefit most from the new development. Those are the properties that should pay the most to provide the infrastructure. Thank you. Mr. Skolnick? Well, well, thank you. Um, I had a letter to the editor in the Gazette last week about this specific topic. And basically, I'm proposing what I call the BLT, the bus lane toll, that contrary to what Mr. El Elrich is, is uh, suggesting, um, it won't cost a billion dollars, and we won't build 98 miles of roadway solely for buses, but rather take the third lane, the left lane of our three-lane roads, and make it a toll lane for cars and buses during rush hour. It will be fully funded by the tolls. We won't have to go for a billion dollars. We won't have the disruption that you have when you construct 98 miles of road. And then those who are concerned about the rain and the rain tax and rain going into the ground, what they're suggesting is to build 98 miles of roadway that, again, affects stormwater runoff at a time when we're trying to reduce that. Mr. Willard. Well, I support the BRT. I think it's a, a very good new idea. It's a cheap way to, uh, to implement uh, mass transit. Um, one thing we must do to implement it is to involve the communities where the, the the BRT will run through. I mean, already the people in Olney are raising concerns about the BRT, and they need to be brought into the process if we are to be able to build it uh, smoothly uh, and without too much controversy. Um, as far as taxes, we may need to raise uh, taxes, as Mr. Elridge said, but I would hope that these taxes would be revenue neutral and that we would uh, uh, cut other taxes uh, in, in uh, cut out of the taxes to make up for the raise in revenue for, for the BRT. All right, well, that's a good segue to our next question, uh, still in transportation, and this is for Mr. Dyer, Ms. Florine, and Mr. Reamer in that order. Uh, it has to do with transportation funding. There are several transportation projects that need funding in Montgomery County that will involve federal, state, and county funds. 
what specific steps would you take in Annapolis and in the county to find county money to pay for its share? Do you support a local gasoline tax to provide transportation funds? And again, first up, Mr. Dyer. No, I do not support a gasoline tax. We've had quite a, <coughs> enough of taxes in this county, but I think the funding question is very important when we look at also <coughs> the projects that we want to build in the county. And for example, in contrast to the BRT, which really has no funding available now and will not qualify for federal funding, I'm looking at the unfinished parts of our highway system in the county that were never built such as the new Potomac River crossing that's been delayed for 50 years. That would actually qualify for federal funding, but additionally, there's a possibility of hiring a private firm to build a road and have it be a toll road and a toll bridge. And it's been done elsewhere in the country where the taxpayer doesn't spend a dime on it. And then you have a a way that you could combine that with the ICC, perhaps have one company take it over and lower the tolls on the whole thing while getting tremendous amounts of cars off the road. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Florine? Well, first of all, let me just clarify that there's nothing in our master plan supporting a Potomac River crossing. Uh, but the transportation funding challenge is a huge one. I commissioned a report on this a couple of years ago, and we've just gone through another um, report on transportation funding. Uh, it's not so easy. Uh, it does, the, does the legislature have the will to raise the gas tax more? I think they're still a, kind of antsy about all that. I think that's the one thing that should be done. Uh, having a local gas tax uh, puts us at a big disadvantage with our neighbors. So I don't see the, that. We talked about that a few years ago. I don't think that, that cuts water. The real issue, frankly, it's federal funding that has been uh, reduced. And actually some of our local highway funding has been taken by the legislature to fund other things. So I'd like to think that our team in Annapolis will fight to get highway user money returned to the local jurisdictions that would help. It's not enough though, and I think we need uh, better partners <coughs> to figure out a solution. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reamer. Well, there are three major projects that need, uh, in my view, a combination of federal, state, and local money. The first is Metro. We have a lot of work ahead of us to expand Metro to serve our residents better um, and to meet the growing demand for Metro services in the future. And that is going to take a federal investment and it's going to take a big state investment. So as council member, I've worked hard to prioritize Metro funding uh, through our county council. Uh, the second is the Purple Line. And uh, that is a federal, state, and local funding um, challenge. And we are working it through with Council Member Leventhal and other council members. I worked hard to make sure that our county capital budget was reprioritized so that expenditures related to the Purple Line were covered. Um, the last is the Corridor Cities Transit Way, which is a bus rapid transit line from Shady Grove all the way to Clarksburg. And again, that will be a combination of federal, state, and local funding. And I think we um, can handle the county obligations within our existing budget. Thank you. All right, our final question and the transportation topic uh, we'll go first to Mr. Fiotes, then to Mr. Leventhal, and then Mr. Owen Williams. And, and this is the question. It involves the Silver Spring Transit Center. What action should the county council take in regards to the Silver Spring Transit Center? What can be done to prevent a similar outcome in a large government project? Mr. Quick Fiotes. answer, tear it down. <laughs> I would like to say the uh, it was a, my knowledge of that is that what is happening now is like a, a patch up on this, um, I think it's a uh, forget the amount of dollars, I think $12 million are going to add to it to patch it up. My experience is that when you start patching something up, it's like anything else. Eventually, it's going to turn around and <clears throat> have more issues of, let's say, uh, falling apart. So anything that's going to be done to that far as I can see, down the road, it's going to cost the county or whoever wants to put money into it, is to turn around and look at it from a different aspect. Because there's no way that you're going to take this issue here and make it any better than what it is by patching it up. So the, the bottom line of it is, um, 
I would not put my, my son in a bus or daughter in a bus that was going to be in that facility. And along the line, there's going to be issues that is more money is going to have to come out of the pocket of the county council uh, to repair. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Leventhal? The structure will be safe. The structure will be remediated. The remediation should be done by the end of this year. Metro will take it over, and it will be open and available for use by the public next year. None of us are going to defend the many, many mistakes that were made by the designer, the uh, engineers, the builders, or by the oversight of county government. This is probably one of the worst uh, examples of infrastructure that has ever happened in Montgomery County history. But it will be fixed. The remediation is nearly done now, and it will be a safe structure. It's a very unusual structure that's not um, being defensive. It's just a fact. And so um, in designing it and uh, making sure that it was structurally sound, a lot of um, new uh, uh, experimentation was tried, and it wasn't all successful, but it is now on the road to being complete. And years from now, it'll be widely used by everyone, and, and I hope that the lessons will be learned in terms of better oversight of construction projects in the future. Thank you. John Lewis? Silver Spring Metro Station is Montgomery County's equivalent of Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff managed hundreds of billions and mismanaged $4 billion for which he's been sent to prison for 150 plus years. The county council, I have no idea what kind of vetting process they use, but if I'm elected to the county council, one of the first things I will ask for is an independent Department of Justice investigation into how something like this could go wrong. Secondly, I would ask that the government force the builders to give us our $130 million back. We have children sitting in uh, trailers, mold-infested trailers, while we're wasting $130 million on a concert hall and another $130 plus million on a bus station that fell apart before it could be used. It's inexcusable, and everyone associated with this project should be under investigation and fired. Well, thank you. That concludes our three questions here. And now we're going to give each of you 20 seconds to add whatever you want to on the question of transportation. We're going to go alphabetically, and so we start off with Mr. Dyer. Yes, it, this is the importance of having a councilman who, under, who understands how federal funding works these days. Uh, Mr. Reamer is incorrect when the CCT became a bus rapid transit line, it no longer is going to qualify for federal funding. Okay. So we need to understand projects that move the most people are the ones that get federal money today. Again, 20 seconds, we're gonna keep this very sharp. Mr. Eldridge. Uh, we'll go back and forth, but I mean, the federal government does fund bus rapid transit programs. They fund them around the country. Um, I do also wanna say that um, on the use of lanes, there is a value in doing mixed use and in case sometimes using existing lanes and other times not using existing lanes and we leave it to the planners to figure out where you can do it without severely impacting traffic flows. Mr. Fiote? Yeah, I think that the uh, <coughs> I think that in um, the master plan, the Montgomery County master plan should be looked at, reviewed and see what method we should take to restructure our transportation system. Swing? Uh, well, I would say with respect to BRT, keep in mind that its uh, potential for success is based on uh, travel figures projected in 2040. Uh, so we'll see what we can build, build and what we can justify given the expense. Slimthal? Shortly after getting elected, I worked with former council member Tom Perez, former planning board chair Derek Burlage, and with community activist Harry Sanders to form an advocacy organization that's now called Purple Line Now. It takes far too long for these projects to get underway, but the Purple Line is scheduled to begin construction in 2015. What a great day that will be if the voters give me another term. I hope I can be there as a council member for the groundbreaking on the Purple Line. What a great day that'll be in 2015. Mr. Williams? If I'm elected to the county council, I will make every effort to stop the construction of the Purple Line. Po uh, poll after poll after survey after survey says, we're not going to use it, but if they want it, let's build it. The reality is, mom and dads out there, you're not taking your kids to soccer practice on the Purple Line or any other mass transit. You're not taking your kids to dance lesson. <clears throat> Mr. Reamer? Uh, well, the previous speaker is not the only one who opposes the Purple Line. Uh, the Republican gubernatorial candidate also opposes the Purple Line and funding for the Quarter Cities Transit Way and other transit projects. So I urge our viewers to vote Democratic so we can get these major projects done. 
Scott? Thank you. Um, I'm concerned about the Silver Spring Transit Center. Uh, a lot of mistakes have been made, as, as mentioned, and unless a lawsuit is brought quickly, the statute of limitations could preclude the county from recovering millions of dollars from these contractors. And uh, I think that the incumbents have to explain why a, a lawsuit has not been brought to date against the contractors. Ms. Ruler? Thank you. I support a gasoline tax because I support anything that would encourage people to use less fossil fuels. This is an extremely important issue going into the future. However, in a time when the middle class is losing ground, we cannot pile tax after tax upon them. And any new tax, anything raised by the gasoline tax should be revenue neutral. Thank you. All right. The second topic, we're going to go from uh, transportation to planning, uh, another key part of what you're going to be uh, doing as county council members. Um, our first group uh, is uh, Mr. Fiotes, Mr. Elrich, and Mr. Dyer in that order. And so our first question has to do with planning and denser zoning. For Montgomery County to continue to grow uh, as developable land diminishes, some advocate the end of single-family home zoning to be replaced by denser urban zones. What do you see as the future of single-family homes, especially in the down-county areas close to transit centers? Uh, I believe, again, Mr. Fiotes, you're up. Yeah. I don't feel that uh, we should eliminate um, <coughs> single-family single, single family housing. I feel that the, as the possibility of Montgomery County spreading out, I don't think we should uh, do change any of the zoning or re reevaluate the zoning to some degree because the uh, zoning uh, can get out of hand as a, in some cases I've seen that happen. And as far as downtown is concerned, uh, I think that uh, what we have is, is probably, uh, I would say, sufficient at this point. Okay. Uh, next up, Mr. Elridge. So I've seen the long-term forecasts for Montgomery County in terms of how many jobs and how many people are expected to take housing. And we have a very good match between the places that we've already zoned for additional housing and the projected increase in the population. There is absolutely no reason to go into the single family neighborhoods. Moreover, the bulk of the projects that are being built, even in the, in the denser areas, tend to be uh, multifamily one and two bedroom apartments. And if we're gonna have a place where people can stay and work, not just when they're single and don't have children, but can stay here when they, when they begin to raise families, you're gonna need the stock of um, single family homes that we have today so people can move from apartments into single family homes. So I think in order to maintain a balance and in order to maintain uh, the ability to house all aspects of the future population as it, as it both grows and as it ages and changes, um, we're gonna need to leave the single family neighborhoods alone and park and planning um, has not proposed anything that would change the character of the existing single family neighborhoods. Last uh, responded in this question, Mr. Dyer. Yes, we, uh, we have a big problem with our county council being beholden to developers with the exception of Mark Elrich. We need a councilman who doesn't get all weak in the knees when a developer walks in the room and to elect a councilman that we can start a conscious uncoupling of the county council from the developers who are, have way too much influence uh, I recognize the difference between an urban area like downtown Bethesda or downtown Silver Spring. It's entirely appropriate to have high density growth in those areas and will continue to do so. However, places like West Bard and Chevy Chase Lake are commercial areas that serve residential neighborhoods around them. They are not urban. And it's critical that we have a councilman who understands that they want to put massive density into these shopping centers, jam the schools that are already overflowing with students, jam the roads, and as they've done for decades, no infrastructure to support it. We can't go on like this. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. Our second group of questions will be answered uh, by Ms. Florine, Mr. Willard, and Mr. Skolnick in that order. And, and this question uh, in planning is, uh, deals with the council's role. Should the council be more involved in approving development projects and sector plans less involved or is the balance just about right right now? Uh, <laughs> well, I think we're pretty involved. 
uh, certainly in the planning process, the master planning process. We also are involved uh, in a zoning case. So there's a particular discrete uh, projects that come through the pipeline. They have a public hearing in front of the hearing examiner, uh, typically. Uh, there are comments from all the professional staffs. Planning board weighs in. A recommendation is made by the hearing examiner, and then we, we decide the case. And those are discrete cases where someone wants to get rezoned from one, one category to another. I think we have, uh, for us to do more than what we do um, already would require uh, uh, us to get rid of the planning board. I mean, that's what that uh, question uh, assumes. And I think we have a good group of citizen planners uh, that perform the function of reviewing the details of the other things. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Mr. Willard. Well, I think the county needs to get, the county council needs to get more involved. Uh, I believe the, ca the <coughs> communities that are affected need to be more involved. I think we need to realize that there are limits to how much urban density we can put into the county. We only have a finite amount of space, so we can't continue to uh, develop forever. And the county council needs to come up with a master plan that recognizes where these limits are, how much density we can, we can afford, and how much urban sprawl we can afford without uh, you know, too much congestion or uh, damaging the environment. Uh, so what we need is a, an overall plan uh, that would uh, inform all sector plan developments. Mr. Skolnick? I think the county should be more involved in making sure that we have adequate public facilities <coughs> before we do a lot of these developments. Um, I'm concerned about the eastern part of the county where the county is, has a massive development, which I support the idea of the massive development, but first we ought to correct and improve our transportation. They're looking at the BRT in the future, which I don't think is going to happen. The BLT can be implemented very quickly and the funding is from the tolls. So that's the emphasis that I would have. In other words, let's make sure that we have adequate public facilities before we approve massive development that will just increase congestion or overburden the schools. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's go to our third question. And the third question in the order will be Mr. Owen Williams, Mr. Reamer, and Mr. Leventhal. This has to do with uh, another topic in planning. That's affordable housing. Uh, and what specific changes would you make to Montgomery County's zoning code to increase affordable housing? Or are the recent changes that have been made going to solve the issue? Again, we start off with Mr. Owen Williams. As a person who has owned more than one home in Montgomery County, <clears throat> I have sort of ambivalent feelings towards uh, the county council creating affordable housing. My first few years out of college, I took no vacations, didn't go out to dinner. I worked 60 hour weeks to come up with a deposit to afford my first townhouse. I watched a number of people who took the easy way out in life who were able to get housing from the government simply because most of them lied on their applications. And I think there's a difference between helping people in desperate need and creating a program that creates handouts that allow people to have one, two, three HUD homes under the guise of affordable housing. I'd like to see that program audited. Okay. Uh, Mr. Reamer? We've made a number of important improvements, several of which I actively pushed for uh, in our zoning code that I believe will really help provide more affordable housing as the county develops over time. Um, but I'd also note that a study came out today that shows that uh, the Washington region is the most expensive place to live in the whole country. And I think what we have is an affordability problem across all kinds of needs. That's why we have to combine all of the tools at our disposal. We have to have affordable bus service. We have to have affordable housing. We have to have policies like raising the minimum wage or increasing the earned income tax credit. We have to have good schools. We have to have affordable child care. All of these things have to fit together so that the families in our community can make a go of it. 
And Mr. Leventhal, you've got the last uh, response in this. We've done so much and still there's more to do. Montgomery County has been in the vanguard of affordable housing policy. We were among the first communities in the United States to adopt inclusionary zoning requiring the 12 and a half percent of all new subdivisions must be maintained below market cost. We put about $50 million a year in our affordable housing fund, which is used for many different purposes, construction, renovation, maintenance, and preservation. Uh, we just adopted a new zoning code uh, that, uh, under Nancy Florine's leadership, makes sure that a builder of a large structure can have additional affordable units without having it count against that builder's density limit. I have legislation pending, which Ms. Florine and Mr. Elrich are supporting, which would provide uh, credits, tax credits to landlords who voluntarily offer for apartments at below market rents. There's a lot of ideas on the table, but there's much more that needs to be done. We're a very desirable community. What we cannot do is repeal the laws of supply and demand. It costs a lot to live here because it's such a great place to live. As luck would have it, Mr. Leventhal, you get a chance to lead us off in the 22nd lightning round. So if you'd like to add to those, uh, your comments there or to any other comments, and then we'll continue on down this path and then back over to Mr. Dyer and finish with Ms. Florine. Uh, well, I just want to talk a little bit about our vibrant arts community. I was sorry uh, to hear the comment earlier that suggested that the Strathmore Hall was a bad expenditure. We have an extraordinary high quality of performance, live music of every range of interest, and I think that our uh, arts community is part of what makes this a highly desirable place to live. It improves our quality of life. It brings grace and beauty to our lives. Mr. Williams? Strathmore Hall is eight miles away from the Kennedy Center. Why we need two buildings eight miles apart that offer that kind of service is uh, foreign to me. Secondly, Ronald Reagan told us a government big enough to give you everything you want is a government big enough to take away from you everything you have. <coughs> government should not be the sole provider of housing. Streamer? <clears throat> well, I wanted to mention that I've been working a lot on technology initiatives, so this is not a rebuttal, but I think the county can do a much better job uh, with um, its own technology as well as uh, fostering a competitive economy for new technology companies. I think we need to really improve our workforce um, and other uh, initiatives in that Mr. area. Mr. Colnick? Right. Regarding affordable housing, I'd like to see more housing vouchers for senior citizens and rather than spend two million dollars a year on funding campaigns that the county council has passed for the on their uh, recent bill, I'd like to use that two million dollars or part of that towards affordable housing for seniors by having more vouchers. Mr. Willard. On the issue of affordable housing, I think the most important uh, thing we can do is to stop tearing it down. All too often we tear down affordable garden apartments in order to put up high rises that end up with fewer units that are affordable. Um, we need to retrofit old buildings that are still affordable so that people continue to live in them. Thank you. And on now to this side, Mr. Dyer. Well, I'm somewhat amused by Mr. Reamer's talk of tech when it turned out the county government is running on Windows 2000 four years after he was elected. And they're trying to stop innovative tech companies like Uber and Lyft and promote the old school Barwood model. And when they had the top 25 tech areas, Montgomery County wasn't on it. Loudon and Prince William were. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. Mr. Ellers. Well, I think we ought to do a better job of um, preserving existing affordable housing. We ought to look at policies that other jurisdictions have uh, the call for no net loss of affordable housing when you do redevelopment. And I wish the council had adopted what Mr. Leventhal and I proposed in the CR zones, which is that if you're going to get bonus density, you should get it for affordable housing rather than a bunch of worthless things that don't contribute much. Ms. Fiotis. Affordable housing, I feel, has a lot, of, a lot of areas that should be looked into very closely. How we're going to deal with it and the way we're going to deal with it. And always, the factor always comes up when you start about taxes. And I don't think we should be taking our taxes and increasing taxes and moving to, into affordable housing when there are different directions we can look into. Ms. Florine. If you ask any uh, third party expert about how you address the issue of affordable housing, they said they'll tell you uh, you need more housing. Uh, I think that we've been doing a pretty good job in our master plans of creating, identifying areas where that works. Uh, and, and let me say, no change is ever going to happen to our single family neighborhoods. That is not on the table. 
Uh, but I think uh, you know, we, we've been creative and we've created some great opportunities <coughs> for new housing. Thank you very much. Let's move down to our third topic. And that third topic is something that Montgomery County is known for in the country and around the world, and that's our diversity. Um, and so this, uh, the first uh, question in the diversity topic will be, go we'll be going to Mr. Skolnick, Mr. Owen Williams, and Ms. Florine in that order. First question is workforce diversity. The Office of Legislative Oversight recently issued a report highlighting the disparity between the diversity of the students in Montgomery County Public Schools and the lack of diversity in the school staff. Does the same disparity exist in the county public workforce? What, if anything, would you advocate doing to increase diversity if it is indeed lacking? Mr. Skolnick, you're up. Right, well I think equal opportunity, advancement in education, training uh, can encourage diversity in the workforce. But I like the topic diversity and, and I've um, argued that we need geographic diversity on the county council. We have a council of nine members, three of which come from tiny Tacoma Park. I believe that we need better geographic diversity on the county council. And I think you'd have better representation from minorities if we went from the current council to a nine member council of geographic districts, each one representing about 110,000 people, so that we don't have a situation where one third of the council comes from a small segment of uh, Tacoma Park of about 17,000 residents out of a population of one million residents and 500 square miles. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Owen Williams? As a alumni of Towson State University, uh, which was a primarily a teacher's university, I noticed the student body of education majors were almost all white females. Now what I would suggest is as students go to a guidance counselor, they're not recommended that they go take a course in underwater basket weaving or some other easy major just to get a, a bachelor's degree in you know, holding hands or walking down the street. Um, there are a lot of talented minorities out there who just are sort of not guided in that direction. I would recommend at the high school level, guidance counselors pointing to uh, people of all diverse walks of life and suggesting to them, you might want to consider becoming a teacher. Uh, I think if you get them at an early stage, uh, they will stick with it through college as opposed to just getting a degree and getting a degree. Thank you. Ms. Florine? Well, on the issue of uh, diversity on the county council, I'll point out that uh, it can benefit from gender diversity as well in the at-large <laughs> race. Uh, but the, also, uh, the issue of workforce diversity, which I believe is a question, mm -hmm. um, the county has, has uh, a small business uh, reserve program that's intended to, to support uh, minority businesses. Uh, we're also uh, working on, frankly, reorganizing our workforce development initiatives uh, to have a an better organized approach to how we support folks getting the necessary skills to succeed in the in the uh, business world. The fact of the matter is Montgomery County is an incredibly diverse place today mm -hmm. and we are seeing that wherever we go uh, whether it's at Montgomery Mall, at MBA, or at the County Council. Uh, so our, I don't think I don't think of this as as the biggest challenge that some people considered it as given the fact that we have some very strong programs designed to support uh, the workforce development program. Our next question is going to be on immigrant health and, and, and that question, Mr. Leventhal, Mr. Fiotis, and Mr. Elrich, uh, for you in that order. Uh, again, immigrant health, uh, should the county provide health, public health services to immigrants who are not funded under the Affordable Health Care Act? Why or why not? Absolutely, we should, Don, and we do. Um, Montgomery County uh, really leads the nation in terms of the numbers of people without health insurance who the county provides access to care. We're going to provide access to health care for about 30,000 individuals this year without health insurance, without regard to immigration status, because it isn't wise public health policy to have sick people in your community, regardless of uh, you know what their passport says. Um, we are going to develop a blended system where our uh, community clinics will become Medicaid providers under the Medicaid expansion. We are also going to continue to provide access to care for those who may not be eligible either for Medicaid or for 
buying into the exchanges. I'm glad the federal government has finally stepped up to the challenge of providing access to care for those without health insurance. Montgomery County has been doing it for many, many years without help from the federal or the state government. And I'm optimistic that when we elect a new governor and lieutenant governor, they will work with us to develop an integrated system of health care delivery with the highest quality standards throughout the state of Maryland. Mr. Fiotes? Yeah, so I'd like to add there that the federal government has a strong obligation in that direction. And I feel that the uh, Montgomery County should definitely focus on every, out, every bit they can to get out of the federal government to protect the interests of those concerned. So I say taxes is not an issue that will probably be a possibility of coming up. But I would like to say that, again, the federal government has a strong obligation in this matter. Okay. Uh, last, uh, Mr. Elridge. Well, I'd like to see the federal government step up and provide the same treatment for everyone. But the fact is they haven't, then they're not going to. And I think it's important that the county continue to do what it do. Um, you cannot afford to have um, areas of public health which jeopardize the population. And I talk about it from the perspective as a teacher. You can't have kids come to school sick because they don't have access to health care. It's in no one's interest, regardless of how people feel about immigration, to, to create that kind of situation. It's also in no one's interest to have these children going to emergency rooms at hospitals getting the most expensive treatment possible for things that could have easily been treated in clinics. So I think it's in all of our interest in terms of controlling health care costs, in terms of public safety, that the county continue to do what it needs to do to ensure that everybody has access to health care and all of us benefit from the protection that health care brings. Thank you. Uh, our, our final diversity question will be uh, Mr. Willard, Mr. Dyer, and Mr. Reamer in that order. And, and, and the question is simply this. How should the county government respond to the economic and social needs of our increasingly diverse population? Mr. Willard? Well, we have a very diverse population. There are over 100 languages being spoken in Montgomery now. Uh, and uh, meeting all these needs will be very difficult. Um, I believe, as a Green Party candidate, that we need a green job corps that will provide jobs for everyone uh, and preserve our future. Um, uh, we need, in addition to that, we need uh, more cooperation between the county and private groups. The only way we can meet everyone's need is by uh, 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 government and private groups working together to, to and to uh, solve the problems that are there. Thank you. Mr. Dyer. Yeah, the first thing we need to do is stop the zoning changes and sector plans this council just passed that are allowing for the demolition of affordable housing countywide in Wheaton, Glenmont, Long Branch, Bethesda, <coughs> Rockville. Uh, that is going to have a tremendous detrimental effect on diversity in our county when we have a council that's top priority is building apartments for rich white people. Secondly, we have tremendous racial disparities in our schools. We have uh, very good schools in some parts of the county and very bad schools in other parts. Uh, one of the advisors to the county council has said that the future of jobs will be retail and restaurant and that we should divert people off of college. I think every child needs to go to college. And secondly, the December surprise that they're going to pull is boundary changes of schools after the election. That slipped out a few months ago. That's not the answer. The answer is making a quality school in every neighborhood. Thank you. Ms. Rimmer, you have the last <clears throat> answer in this topic. Good. Well, I, I think that the schools are the place where our diversity challenges are, are best met. Um, you know, it's where they ha have a great impact and it's where we have a lot of ability to move the needle. So, um, you know, the bottom line is ensuring that every child has a bright future and that means that the schools where we have our newer immigrant population, our lower income population, need to have adequate resources and they need to have programs like English as a Second Language, which the County Council uh, supported a significant funding increase for and smaller class sizes, incentives for teachers to stay in those schools. Um, so those are all really, really important. Another important dimension of it is having culturally competent government through 
particularly through uh, nonprofit partnerships. And many new immigrant communities have very vibrant nonprofit organizations that provide health services or other kinds of community services. And those organizations can and do partner, and we should do it more with the county government. Well, thank you. Let's go to the lightning round again. 20 seconds apiece. Let's, let's hold it to the 20 seconds. Mr. Willard, you're going to have the first 20 seconds. And we'll go to Mr. Dyer and then back around ending Mr. Skolnick. All right. Well, on the issue of immigrant health, the, the county has a, a lot of very good programs that are designed to help people who need uh, uh, health care. Um, the problem is all too often these programs are not funded to the level that would support the need that is there. And people end up with very frustrating experiences and long waits to get care. So we need to re revisit the funding for all okay. these programs. Thank you. Mr. Dyer? Yes, I have to say that as far as the diversity, uh, again, with schools, we need to have universal pre-K for every child, and we have to have every child on the road to college. We found that uh, African-American students and Latino students, the achievement gap between them and white students has grown since the council took office four years ago. Thank you, Mr. Elridge. Uh, I want to um, say I'm glad Mr. Dyer raised the issue of universal pre-K. I really think we need to focus a lot on, um, on kids from the age of two, two on up. Um, if you're interested in where, what students are going to be able to do and integrate into society when they leave high school, they have to start school as well prepared as we can make them. And I think universal um, early childhood is really important. Ms. Fiotes? I think that we have to look at a, the second thought is the vocation era, a vocation, where a child can, a kid can go to school and learn a trade. Because a lot of children don't like to sit in a school, a school room, an environment, and not be able to soak in what's going on. But to have some kind of vocational training program, uh, as in Montgomery County Council, I mean, I'm sorry, as in um, Montgomery, um, I'm sorry, I don't know, blank here. Okay, all right, Ms. Floyd. Among the many things uh, Mr. Dyer has said that, are, that is really incorrect, uh, one is a suggestion that we have failing schools here in Montgomery County. We do have schools where there are more kids in need, and we're putting a lot of resources into those facilities to make sure those kids are successful. One of Montgomery County's strengths is its diversity because we are a community of opportunity, and I'm really considered a badge of honor that we have so many diverse groups here. Thank you. Mr. Leventhal? Health reform is so much more than just insurance reform. We do have a lot of work to do to achieve the triple aim of excellent patient care, lower per capita cost, and improve population health. But it is not correct that there are long waits for clients of our community clinics. I had the leadership of Mercy Clinic in my office today. I asked how long it takes to get an appointment. If you're an existing patient, it's one or two days. If you're a new patient, it's within a week. That's quicker than I get to see my doctor, and I'm, I have excellent health insurance. Mr. Arnold Williams? I met with the school board the other day, and I learned that 23% of our students are black, 27% of our students are Latino. You don't get more diverse than that when only about 40% of the kids are white. As for health care and other issues regarding, we just can't afford to be a sanctuary county and play Santa Claus. Mr. Reamer? Well, I wanted to just state that I do support strongly our county's uh, funding of programs that provide health insurance for people who don't have, or health care for people who don't have health insurance. And that certainly means a large number of undocumented residents. But uh, as has been said, you know, if one of those kids is in class with my son, uh, it doesn't help my son to learn if that kid is having trouble at home and his parents don't have a, a good job and can't, are sick. Mr. Skolnick. Okay, I have proposed an affordable pre-K program where the kids who need it go in July and August before they enter kindergarten. And then if after kindergarten they still need the help, then they go the following July and August. This way we can have accommodate the pre-K and the post-K using existing classrooms. Thank you. All right, well, our fourth topic, and, and I, I think we've got time for a fourth topic, so let's go to the fourth topic, and that is uh, deals with services. And, and we're going to have the first question. Uh, first grouping will be Mr. Owen Williams, followed by Mr. Reamer, followed by Mr. Fiotes. And that first question uh, involves mental health clinics. 
Once upon a time, Montgomery County had its own clinics for mental health services, which are now mostly closed. Would you be willing to increase government funding for mental health services here? Would you revive the clinics, increase payments to doctors, or do you have other ideas on this issue? Mr. Owen Williams. When I was in high school, the ACLU filed a lawsuit against the Reagan administration to close a lot of major health care centers. That's where we developed the so-called uh, homeless problem. Those were people kicked out of St. Elizabeth's and mental hospitals all over the country. I thought that was an evil act. I would like to see that case revisited in light of what we've seen thus far. There was money in the federal budget to address this issue. Um, it should be partially Montgomery County's problem, but because this is a national issue, the, the federal government should get back into the business of housing, medicating, mm -hmm. and treating these people who are in desperate need. It does not make sense to have a man with a five-year-old mentality roam in the streets. Uh, you would not put your five-year-old child out on the street. Um, and I believe it's an issue that needs, a case that needs to be revisited and hopefully overturned. Mr. Reamer. Mental health is a very important issue and it's one that the council has made a, a real priority of. I'd like to tell you about the program that we created in this year's budget uh, just several months ago. Advocates from the mental health community came to us and proposed that we adopt a model that had been tested out in Baltimore to create a mobile crisis unit of uh, care providers who could go to a school where there might be a, a child who is experiencing a mental health um, you know, need and evaluate that, that child and then make sure that they get care. Um, or other kinds of mobile situations where a person doesn't have to go to a clinic but the county can actually identify a timely need and deploy. And that was not in the executive's budget, but the council did support that. We created that, uh, we funded it, and it's going to get up and running over the course of this fiscal year. So it's just one of many examples of the, uh, the serious commitment of this county council to mental health. Thank you. Mr. Fiotes. I feel uh, that the federal government has a strong responsibility for those people in need of help. The federal government should get back into it and fund every issue you can think about regarding this mental health. There's too many people you find walking the streets that need help. And it's a sad situation where we have to look at this every day and see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question is going to go to Mr. We Leventhal first, then Mr. Willard, and then finally Mr. Dyer. It has to do with nonprofits. Um, and, and this is something that's been mentioned a couple of times in, in prior answers, but let's, we're going to focus solely on nonprofits here. Much of the safety net in Montgomery County is provided by nonprofits using grants from the county. What changes, if any, would you make to grant procedures being used currently? Would you tie continued funding to results-based accountability? How do you end funding when the existence of a nonprofit might depend on the county grant? Again, Mr. Leventhal. As chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee, uh, the preponderance of contracts with nonprofit organizations do go through my committee. In addition, the council itself makes grants a couple of million dollars a year and I'm responsible for the policy that made sure that those grants were merit-based, that they were reviewed by a group of citizen volunteers, that it was not a purely political process. I'm an advocate for competitive bidding. I think that there should not be uh, sole source contracts going for multiple years. I think that needs change and uh, the capacity of community groups to respond to those needs uh, adapt over time. Uh, we do have contract monitoring. I think it can consistently be improved and I'm a strong advocate for making sure that we do ensure outcomes and results for our investment of taxpayer dollars. But the partnership with nonprofit service providers, as Mr. Reamer said correctly earlier, is vitally important because those organizations are often best suited, culturally competent, speak the language that the clients speak, able to understand the cultural needs and, and meet people's real needs. Mr. Willard? Well, uh, nonprofits are uh, a vital part of uh, the county's services to the people. Um, the, and uh, I agree that they can often uh, uh, provide these services more efficiently uh, uh, than the county government. However, we need to be, we need to strictly follow these services to make sure that they are performing their work efficiently, uh, that they are not overly uh, spending too much money on overhead and not enough on services. So uh, this is something that needs to be um, followed very closely and reviewed, um, uh, reviewed often. Thank you. Mr. Dyer? 
but we do need greater oversight of nonprofit contracts. About six years ago, uh, $900,000 of taxpayer money was unaccounted for by a nonprofit and has never been found to my knowledge. Secondly, we hear all the wonderful talk tonight that everything is well in hand, but in fact, uh, recently the uh, the vol I mean, in the as far as nonprofits, the courts found that Mr. Leventhal's policy had violated the First Amendment rights of volunteers with a county nonprofit that helps Latinas who are in a crisis pregnancy. Uh, organization I read in the Sentinel had put out a report that the attempt by Mr. Leventhal to criminalize panhandling was quote cruel and unusual punishment. I think we need to, that we can certainly make all kind of improvements in nonprofit service. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, we're going to have just enough time to to do this last question. Unfortunately, we're going to have an opportunity for the lightning round, so we can uh, have enough time for your closing statements. This last one uh, is Mr. Elrich, Ms. Florine, and then Mr. Skolnick. It has to do with community involvement uh, services. Much of the community involvement with the county council centers around testimony before the council, especially in asking for funding for services. What other ways would you suggest for the council to hear what residents want to happen? Do you have specific ways in which to involve those residents who are not currently being heard today? Uh, Mr. Elrich. Well, I think there are a couple of things we can do. One is make better use of, of the internet um, and solicit more opinions and give people more opportunities to provide input to us. We've just done, for example, we, our budget um, is now totally online and totally visible and it's going to give people a chance to actually drill down and see you know where the programs are and where the spending is which hopefully will give people a better opportunity to say this isn't meeting my needs or these aren't my priorities or could you spend more in a particular program I think that all of us you know need to do a better job of reaching out I, um, I go to innumerable community meetings and, commu and meetings with different groups and uh, my staff goes to all of the um, County Regional Service Center meetings because I can't see and hear everything in my office. We really need to be out there as much as possible in the community, hearing what people think and uh, soliciting their opinions. Ms. Lorraine? The uh, internet has really made it a lot easier for us to hear from folks, so I don't think uh, public hearings are the main point in time anymore where we uh, hear folks' uh, in, uh, concerns and interests, and in fact, they comment up until the time we vote. Uh, 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 so that's, I think, uh, important. The big challenge is that we hear from about the same people on most issues. Uh, the challenge is getting out there, and I agree with Mark. Uh, the main, the best way to do that is to just get into the community, uh, talk with folks, listen to them, and, and just ask folks wherever we are, uh, what's going on, where can we be helpful, what's your reaction to this and that. I spend a lot of time uh, like Mark in community meetings, uh, listening to folks and, and asking for their input, their suggestions and their criticism. Uh, it's very helpful and it's very important. Thank you. Um, Mr. Skolnick, you have the final word of the final round of the final question. Okay, that means I get extra time? Uh, no, Mr. <laughs> Skolnick, you do not. In fact, you've now lost your time. Right, go ahead, please. <laughs> Rewind the clock, please. Um, we're seeking a position as council members at large to represent one million people, 500 square miles. It's almost an impossible task to do that realistically. If we want to hear from the residents, let's change to nine regional districts where we represent 110,000 people, where we live in that area, where we'll meet the people daily and they'll be able to communicate with us. I think it's just an impossible task to say that a council member at large is going to hear from and meet with one million residents or a, a reasonable portion of them. So I really think we need reform. It's long overdue. Change the council from the five, four to nine regional districts. Okay. Uh, thank you all uh, for the discussions, your, your responses. We're now going to go to closing statements. And so I'm going to read off how, or the, the, the list and, and uh, the order so that you all can be prepared. It'll be Mr. Reamer, Mr. Willard, Mr. Leventhal, Mr. Dyer, Mr. Owen Williams, Mr. Elrich, uh, Mr. Fiotes, Ms. Florine, and Mr. Skolnick get a chance to be the cleanup uh, again. <coughs> and I think uh, without further ado, um, I invite you, Mr. Reamer, uh, 90 seconds 
for your uh, closing statement, or a minute and a half, as I was corrected earlier. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you for those in the viewing audience for tuning into this discussion. Uh, again, I'm Hans Reamer. I'm running for re-election to the council at large. Um, before serving on the county council, I worked for many different <coughs> nonprofits in the government and political uh, sectors. I worked for AARP for several years on retirement issues and community engagement. I worked for Rock the Vote on getting young people involved. I was the uh, National Youth Vote Director for the Obama presidential campaign in 2007, uh, where I got a great insight into how technology and social change really can come together. Um, in the last four years, uh, I think our county has made great strides. We've dealt with some significant challenges brought about by the Great Recession. I think we have put this county onto a sustainable and responsible path with its budgeting and with prioritizing our important programs like our county schools, um, our transportation needs, our parks, our human services, and I would ask for your support to uh, keep that work going. Um, one issue that I didn't get a chance to talk about that I'd like to really focus on over these next four years, and I know I'm not alone in my concern about this, uh, is early childhood and child care. And I would like to see the county really do more to help families meet their needs for good quality, affordable child care. Uh, it's one of the expenses that I think really keeps working class families as well as everybody else uh, from getting ahead. So I'd like to work on that more. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Mr. Willard. Well, I'm running for county council because I want to build a sustainable future so that our children and grandchildren can enjoy the same quality of life that we do. I believe there are many creative solutions that we can use to, to achieve this goal. For example, the county can help mitigate climate change by leading the transition to renewable energy. The county can lease out its roof space and right-of-ways for crowd-funded solar projects. We can build a thriving green economy by creating a green job core that would uh, create jobs for, for our, um, our youth. We need a comprehensive development plan that, it, that would determine how much growth the county can afford without excessive congestion or damaging the environment. Transit needs to be an integral part of any new development plans. Economic justice is equally important to achieving a sustainable economy. The council should be congratulated for leading the way on raising the minimum wage. Another step the county could take would be to require all contractors to reveal the ratio between the highest paid executive and the lowest paid worker and use this as a factor in awarding uh, contract bids. We face serious problems in the future, but working together, we can solve them. I ask you for your vote, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Willard. Mr. Leventhal. I want to thank the voters of Montgomery County for electing me three times to this office. I brought passion, honesty, and integrity to my work. It's a tremendously important opportunity to help people every day, and I enjoy going to work every day to assist people to get their problems solved and their questions answered. I know I've made a difference. I've been responsible for the Montgomery Cares Network of Community Clinics. I'm responsible for significantly reducing the prevalence of homelessness in our community. Regarding panhandling, which was brought up earlier, I do discourage community members from giving to panhandlers. Instead, our generous residents should give to bona fide charity that will assist in outreach and case management. I'm the co-founder of Bethesda Green, a model of environmentally sustainable living, and I co-founded Purple Line Now, which next year will finally achieve our goal of seeing the groundbreaking of a transit system that will connect the two legs of the red line with the orange and uh, green lines and Amtrak. Um, the Purple Line is going to be a, a culmination of a great deal of work and effort, even during the period of time when people thought it wouldn't happen because we had a Republican in the governor's mansion. Fortunately, we're moving ahead together. I've got a lot of ideas for legislation I'm going to be working on. We're going to restrict the use of toxic pesticides in our community that damage our public health. We're going to work to ensure economic opportunity and make sure that we have uh, earned sick and safe leave for all employees. These are bills that I'm preparing to introduce in the next few months. Thank you, Mr. Leventhal. Mr. Dyer. 
this council has failed by every measure in the last four years. They haven't attracted a single large corporation to the county in over a decade. For the first time in history, no Chamber of Commerce in Montgomery County has endorsed any of the incumbents. That is an astonishing vote of no confidence by our business community. And they've had the worst traffic congestion in America, and their own report says that schools have declined since 2010. Now, my plan to finish our highway system will take 25% of the traffic off the American Legion Bridge as shown by the study of the Council of Governments. My uh, plan for growth and development is to protect the suburban character of our residential neighborhoods and protect the existing affordable housing they're trying to tear down. And finally, I believe that pre-K is important as well as the being on track to a college education for every child and a great school in every neighborhood, not shipping people out to another part of the county. But how can you do this and have the progressive values of Montgomery County? Certainly not by electing someone like Hans Reamer who gets $500 from Mitt Romney's Bain Capital, thousands of dollars from his sugar daddy Mitch Rails of Donaher Corporation, both pioneers in outsourcing of American jobs to China. So vote for me, Robert Dyer, on election day for change that fits your values. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. Mr. Owen Williams. When I speak to people in the county, I ask them to vote the way they live. If everyone voted the way they live, to be honest with you, there wouldn't be one elected Democrat in Montgomery County. One of the things I'd like to do if I'm elected to your council is I want to sell the liquor stores. We're the only county in the United States that owns a liquor business. This is ridiculous. We have no business in that business. Uh, that $50 million would help, if not get our children out of those uh, mold infested trailers that they're going into every day with no climate control and no bathrooms. One of the other things I'd like to do, and New York finally got wise to this, create uh, tax-free work zones to attract businesses back into the, the county and the state. Uh, we chased them all out. Well, this county council chased them all out. Right now, we're solely dependent on the federal government, which will someday diversify and put a lot of its major agencies in states all over the county. And when they do, we've been eating at that trough for the last 50 years, and that's the only food we know. Uh, I would also like to macro manage. I'd like to be a macro manager. I've successfully managed over $600 million without a complaint. I'm the only one with financial background and a financial common sense logic. And I'm well aware of the fact we cannot afford to play Santa Claus to the world. That has to stop. So I would like to be a responsible spender of your money and hopefully get some of it back to you. Um, so for that reason, I ask that you elect me, your voice of reason, and, and allow me to bring Montgomery County to what it was when I was a child in this county. Thank you, Mr. Owen Williams. Uh, Mr. Elrich. So in three weeks, county voters are going to go to the polls and you're going to elect the next members of the county council. And I'm asking for your vote. Um, I've worked to protect the quality of life. I think that's one of the most important things we do in this county. And I've worked hard to represent the communities and listen to the concerns the people in the neighborhoods have. I've worked to protect neighborhoods from zoning changes that would have had negative impacts on their communities. And I've worked for environmental protection. I was one of the leaders in the fight to protect 10 Mile Creek. I work to require new development, provide the money to build the infrastructure that it requires because I believe that those who benefit most should bear the cost of the infrastructure. I've worked to support um, county schools because I think you know it's one of the major selling points of this county is the education system that we have and there's no better investment we make. I was a leader on the fight to raise the minimum wage and I was glad to work with the district and, and with Prince George's County to make that happen regionally. There is nothing more important we could have done to address poverty. Working families shouldn't have to live in poverty, and a person who goes to work every day ought to bring home an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. Um, we've been slow to the cover, recover from the recession, but this county council has worked hard to protect basic services, to protect fire and police, to protect our investments in education. And as we've emerged from the recession, we've put more money into restoring library services and recreation services and things that people in the community value. 
I intend to continue working on those issues <coughs> as well as putting emphasis on providing transportation because if we're going to compete for jobs in the new world, we're going to have to be able to move people. And if we're going to deal with global warming, we're going to have to do something about our transportation network and get people out of single occupancy vehicles. Um, I hope I can have your support on November 4th. It's an important election, and I hope you feel I've served you well. Thank you, Mr. Elrich. Mr. Fiote. Mm, I, <laughs> um, I was born and raised in the great state of Maryland, and I've been living in Montgomery County for the last 40 years. I've owned and managed my own businesses, and uh, including real estate and development, and I have experience in zoning, construction, and capital investments. I also worked in the U.S. Senate. Montgomery County is a strong county with many resources. <coughs> it has a potential to lead the state of Maryland, but I'm concerned about the direction that Montgomery County is going. I hear from voters that they love Montgomery County, as I do. They want to live here and they want their children to live here and be part of our county's future. In order to do that, we need, to get, we need good economic decisions today. Fiscal responsibility is the key to the success of Montgomery County. We need to focus on lowering taxes, controlling spending, so we can continue investing in the things that matters to our citizens. I appreciate your support in the election. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fiotis. Uh, Ms. Florine. Thank you. I'm Nancy Florine. I'm a, uh, currently sitting as an at-large member of the Montgomery County Council. I've devoted most of the past uh, 30 years, uh, one way or the other, in public service to the citizens of Montgomery County. And I will tell you, uh, the issues that I've learned uh, exist here in the county are not simple ones. They're complex, and we have not really had even a chance to dip into them, really, tonight. But one thing my experience has taught me is to listen really carefully to folks, to ask hard questions and to do my homework. And I worry about the people who aren't in the room as much as I worry about the people who are in the room, because I think that's important to think of the breadth and depth of Montgomery County. I'm committed to working with you to make sure that we do the best and the right things for Montgomery County, even though they may involve hard decisions. But what's important is creating a better future for everyone Next four years, I pledge to work to ensure the county's fiscal sustainability. I pledge to work to increase job opportunities, and I certainly pledge to work to make sure that our kids get the education that they need to be successful. And every time I run for office, I've been honored to receive the endorsement of the Washington Post and the Gazette and your vote, and I ask for your vote once again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Florine. And, and once again, Mr. Skolnick, you have the last word. With extra time. No, I'm just All kidding. All the extra time you want up to <laughs> a minute and a half or 90 seconds. Right, right thank you. Um, Montgomery County has a million people. Our government, county government spends about $5 billion now a year. We need to, and as you heard tonight, we have a lot of challenges. So my goal is to make the government more affordable, more efficient. I mentioned a couple of these during the earlier part of tonight. One was the uh, bus lane toll which instead of the BRT, which costs a, at least a billion dollars, the bus lane toll would be paid by user tolls. Um, I also mentioned pre-K and post-K education. In July and August, in existing school rooms, before they enter kindergarten and after they uh, leave kindergarten. Uh, there are two others that I'd like to mention. One is the repealing the maintenance of effort law. This is a state law that requires counties to spend at least as much on their per student each year in the future. And that's harmful to Montgomery County where we've been very generous with our schools and we should continue, but it, it puts an unfunded mandate on us and that should be repealed. It's a, it's, a, it's a major impact. And finally, there's a proposal that I've raised during the campaign which is free tuition at Montgomery College for volunteer first responders, firefighters, EMS, and police auxiliary, and also for volunteer tutors in our public schools, they would get free tuition at Montgomery College. So we can get help the kids with their college tuition, at the same time get vital services for the county. Thank you very much, Mr. Skolnick. You're welcome. Appreciate it, and thank all of you, and thank all of you in the viewing audience for joining us for, for this very impo uh, important forum. Very appreciative of the candidates for spending their valuable time with us. This forum is just one of the programs of Montgomery County Media 
uh, is hosting with the League of Women Voters to prepare residents of Montgomery County for the 2014 general election. Go to mymcmedia.org to obtain a program schedule for this and the other debates we sponsor. Also at mymcmedia.org, you can view a rebroadcast of this forum. I want to remind you that early voting will begin Thursday, October 23rd at designated sites around the county. On Tuesday, November 4th, the polls will open at 7 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. You can locate your polling station on the Board of Election website. Voting is a sacred privilege in the United States of America. Please choose to exercise your responsibility by voting in this year's election. Thank you, and we'll see you at the polls. Save time on Election Day. Vote between October 23rd and 30th at one of nine early voting centers in Montgomery County. Voting hours are 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Find the early voting center most convenient to you by visiting our website, 777vote.org. During the early voting period, wait time information is also available on our website. You choose the location, you choose the date. Remember, your time, your voice, your vote. Ahorre tiempo el día de la elección. Vote en uno de los nueve centros de votación anticipada en el condado de Montgomery del 23 al 30 de octubre. Las horas de votación son de las 10 a.m. a las 8 p.m. Encuentre el centro más conveniente visitando 777vote.org. Durante la votación anticipada, el tiempo de espera también se puede encontrar en nuestro sitio web. Usted escoge el sitio y la fecha. Recuerde, su tiempo, su voz, su voto. The 2014 gubernatorial election is almost here. Make your voting experience a pleasant one by following these tips. Know your polling place. Review your sample ballot. Decide how you will vote. Mark your sample ballot to use as a guide before arriving. And vote mid-morning to avoid long lines. You may also vote in advance of election day, during early voting or by mail. Remember, your time, your voice, your vote. La elección general gubernamental de 2014 se aproxima. Haga su experiencia de votar placentera siguiendo estos consejos. Conozca su centro electoral. Revise su papeleta de muestra. Decida cómo votar. Marque su papeleta de muestra y úsela como guía. Vote durante las horas del mediodía para evitar las largas filas. También puede votar antes del día de la elección, durante la votación anticipada o por correo. Recuerde, su tiempo, su voz, su voto.